Jerry Santoyo, and uh, uh, later we'll have Ben Falk. These are sweet, kind, lovely people, and for the next two hours, uh, it won't be that. It'll it'll be me instead. Uh, so for the woman who was wanting to shame me into a lesser life, she might want to tune back in when Ben Falk comes back, because I'm sure I've never heard Ben speak. I'm sure he'll be perfectly lovely. <laughs> And I have to put this slide in here so that people, uh, so that the other uh, permaculture constructors will actually still talk to me. Oh, right. Occupy Monsanto calls me the bad boy of permaculture. Um, so I'm going to do the horrible thing that uh, you would never want a presenter to do. Um, oh, let's see. Streaming up on Rocket Mass Ears. Yes, yes. So, well, so, so Diego told me I shouldn't read the little messages at the bottom, but I'm sorry. I just want to read them all. <laughs> Um, uh, space aliens buy bricks of cards. <laughs> Everyone here should do the same. Um, so Debbie, still waiting for yours. You're waiting for your DVDs. Um, I I think bring it up in the forums at Permies, or um, you can also bring it up with Bart at RichSoil.com. And um, as far as I know, there's lots of people reporting that theirs have shown up just yesterday or the day before. So they're they're arriving now. They're arriving now. Um, so I'm going to do the horrible thing. I'm going to read my own damn slides. Most folks that want change tell a dozen people how bad people should stop being bad. Over a 10-year span of time, they may have told 100 people about which bad people to be angry at. And this is this first line. This is I kept thinking about this as Larry was talking about um, <clears throat> uh, different kinds of conflict and, and how nature is is not always sweet and gentle um i believe that conflict comes from a difference of knowledge set and so um i i kind of think that the more larry goes out and shares his knowledge set then the more we're all on the same page and that goes for all the permaculture speakers for all the permaculture bigs and um as as well as so many good people out there um, talking about good things. The more that they share that knowledge set, and of course it all gets convoluted when bad people share misinformation for their own devious needs. Um, so uh, uh, I'm playing the long game. Hundreds of tidbits of knowledge spread out over many years. And, and of course in the world of permaculture, there are thousands of tidbits of knowledge. And uh, it's, it's, it's going to take a lifetime to share all of these things. Um, uh, fortunately, I'm not the only one, and so um, uh, there, there, there's Larry and Ben and Diego and uh, so many other people all all sharing tidbits just as quickly as we can. And the more that we can get it out there, the more that we can come to um, a, a common understanding and thus el eliminating conflict in general. Um, in, in, in my theory, my philosophy, uh, if I say permaculture after each tidbit, then eventually a person might think, I keep hearing this word associated with cool things. And then they go out and they search for more permaculture stuff on their own. And this is my strategy for world domination. <laughs> if you like this sort of thing, <laughs> Chad. <laughs> All right. As of this moment, I have uttered permaculture to 22 million people. And you know, this was done in March, this is a slide set from last March, and I reach 1.4 million people per month. So I'm sure are we we're getting close to 30 million, I suspect. Um, <clears throat> this presentation is going to cover 72 bricks, and I refer to a brick, as unlike which is kind of confusing because we had that card Kickstarter come out, and apparently in the world of cards, 12 decks of cards is referred to as a brick. So it's like, oh, no, now there's confusion. But um, 72 bricks, I, I refer to these as bricks for building a better world. And so um, in the past, before I, before I bought land, <laughs> I would try to put out a new brick every day, a new brick of information. And uh, I haven't done very much of that lately. So my apologies to those people signed up on my daily-ish emails and more about my land and stuff. But... Um, <clears throat> This presentation will hopefully make up for that. 72 bricks, um, just a taste of each one. I mean, any one of these can probably be expanded to be a, a presentation on its own. Um, some some could probably fill a library. Uh, some are going to fill, like, uh, by the end of two minutes, we are all done with that brick. 
Um, and more importantly, different bricks will resonate differently with different people. So some people will really groove on some things and other people will groove on other things. We're gonna do uh, 12 at a time and then we're gonna have a little bit of a break as I go into like a little segue. Um, and then we'll come back and do 12 more. Otherwise it's just 72, it's like reading a laundry list. <clears throat> Number one, the rocket mass heater. Um, I, so who, who has not heard of the rocket mass heater? Give me an idea. Just any kind of character typed in there. I want to. I want to. I want to try and milk this interaction. Me, 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 me. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, this this may very well be the most sustainable way that you can heat a conventional home. Um, the the key is seventy five percent of home energy use goes towards heat. You start talking about that fucking light bulb. And it's just stupid. That's nonsense. That's all the light bulb stuff is all about people getting rich. And they're trying to sucker you into um, parting with funds so that they can get rich, rich, rich. And um, if, I'm going to complain more about that later. Really, if you're going to save energy, you focus on heat and, and ways that are going to save you energy in that. Okay, now, um, uh, somebody is saying something about colder climates. So yes, heat in colder climates. In warmer climates, we can talk about how to be cooler. Now, <laughs> I live in Montana. Guess what we're going to talk about today? <laughs> so um, these things will heat your home with one-tenth of the wood of a conventional wood stove. And then you would think that it might be one-tenth the smoke, but it's actually one one-thousandth of the smoke. <clears throat> and then um, uh, on top of that, oh, now I'm getting all kind of. I'm, I'm, I should. I think. I think I'm learning that Diego's right. I shouldn't try to read the notes <laughs> that are flying by. Um, uh, people. People are able to heat their homes with nothing but the twigs that naturally fall off the trees in their yard. And you got to think about all of these people that are taking those same twigs, putting them into the garbage stream, or they are putting them into the recycle bin, or something like that. Those twigs are just going out of our useful space. Um, and so this way, instead of having a big gob of pollution on the other end of an electrical wire or some kind of big gob of pollution somewhere else that's bringing heat to your home, you take full ownership of your heating needs and it's far cleaner and it's using far less than the other techniques for heating that are available today. So here's a general drawing of how a rocket mass heater works. It's a very different way of burning wood. Oh, look, the little animated thing. Do you guys see the animation? Oh, Jocelyn, no, Jocelyn's not here today. <laughs> the Wafati. Okay, when we're going to go talk about different ways to be able to... Um, heat your home, this design might be superior. Now, before, the rocket mass heater may be the most sustainable way to heat a conventional home. Here is an unconventional home. This is a design that uses the heat from summer to heat your home in the winter. And for those of you that like it cool because you live someplace warm, you can use cool in a way, and this, I, I know this is contrary to the, to the laws of physics, but in a way, you're going to use the cool from winter to cool your home in the summer. It's going to use thermal inertia to do this, not solar stuff. This is all based on thermal inertia. So this is a very simple home design. It will look like a log cabin on the inside with a lot of light, and on the outside, it can be made, and they're generally made to be practically invisible. So they're they're integrated with the earth. So this is this is um, a, a collaboration between a lot of different ideas. A lot of it is Mike Ayler's work, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, how to get around code restrictions? Hey, buddy, I live in a place where there are no code restrictions. <laughs> so that's where you start. 
Um, and then, of course, there's uh, the stuff about uh, um, uh, Art Ludwig stuff about, and I, I'm going to talk about him a little bit later, about how if you're going to change the world and if you're going to innovate, you need to break the law. You need, you need, you need to make that change happen. And Art, Art Ludwig, of course, is a great example of what you need to do. And this is something that Martin Luther King Jr. also uh, tries to convince us to do. You have to knowingly and lovingly break that law. Be prepared to face those consequences in order to be able to change the world. Do some epic shit, as Larry Santoyo would say. All right, number three. <clears throat> uh, an experiment I did a few years ago where I cut 87% off of my electric heat bill. Um, and by the way, this was a 40-watt incandescent light bulb that saved me $900 in electricity. So when they try to tell you that these things don't save energy, remember, they are lying to you. So, of course, these things are being banned. I wonder why. Um, uh, so what I did was, is rather than heat the entire house, I turned the temperature in the house down to 50 degrees, and then I heated the person. Now, the slides that we're seeing at the bottom here, this is a woman who sat in this chair, and you can see she's not overly dressed. And yes, it is the same lady in the in the light bulb video. <laughs> this is Camille. And so um, she uh, um, uh, sat in this area, which was heated by a variety of means. And you can see above her, let's see if I can find my little pointeroo here. Oh, I don't have, I don't, I'm not worried about it. So anyway, you can kind of see right now, it's pointing at there's an incandescent light set up shining down on her. So there's 80 watts going into this, 80 watts to heat her instead of all the power that's required to heat the entire house. Number four, 500 hot showers from one compost pile. So uh, this is Brian Kirkliet in Bellingham, Washington at Inspiration Farm. And uh, he just has his little compost pile with a coil of poly pipe in it. And that's where he gets his hot water for people to shower. So he taught, he taught a PDC there. Um, so for two weeks, uh, everybody got to shower. Um, and then on top of that, throughout the summer, he had a, uh, some interns that used this. And it lasted for about three months. We calculated out that they got 500 hot showers, but they could have easily gotten like a couple of thousand uh, hot showers. <laughs> Google culture. <laughs> so... <clears throat> This is nothing more than soil on wood. And, and I know that a lot of you are, uh, uh, are Jack Spearco fans. Go ahead and, and do the shout out for Jack, <laughs> TSP. Um, I, saw the, I saw the TSP stuff go by earlier. There it is, TSP. <laughs> so uh, he wants to call them woody beds, but I'm, I disagree with Jack. Jack was here at my place a couple weeks ago. And, um, and we, we argued about this, as we argue about many things. But uh, um, basically, yes, it is true. What Jack says is true. Hugel culture actually means raised bed in German. And, uh, but however, here in the United States, it has evolved to have this deeper meaning. And now we've got a word that we can agree on. And vocabulary is such a powerful tool. Um, and in fact, earlier, when um, uh, uh, Larry was talking about patterns, then I've got this software engineering background, and, and on, when it comes to patterns, so many software engineers want to throw patterns into everything that they do because, um, uh, uh, you know, it must be better now because it has more patterns. And I finally got to the point where I believe that the value of patterns is to extend our vocabulary and nothing more. And so um, I think Google culture is an extension of our vocabulary. And when we use this word, we know what we're talking about. So I, I, I'm going to continue to hang on to the word Google culture, even though uh, Jack has a mighty empire and Jack continues to push for woody beds. Um, <clears throat> but if you stack this up high enough, like what we see in the pictures here, then you can go all summer long without the need of any irrigation. You can grow all your favorite gardening plants. Um, <clears throat> plus, of course, the, the, the nutrients and all the other benefits that come with hugo culture bed, beds. Um, but, but for the, you know, the value of this is tremendous. And I, I, I'm, I've got, I could, I could easily fill uh, six hours talking just about hugo culture. Um, so I'm going to move on.
Oh, look, here's some more. So this picture on the left, this is a picture from uh, what Sepp Holzer did in Dayton, Montana, um, a little over a year ago. And you can see the, the, um, the hugel culture beds um, kind of between the bits of water in the closer up part of the pictures, and that they, they don't follow straight lines. Um, and then they can see the lake to the right of what he made. Um, oh yeah, people are going to start asking Hugo culture questions. That will take an hour at least. <laughs> but you can see on the, the pictures on the right, the important thing is is that look at the dry landscape in the background. Now this is last year. <clears throat> so I took that photo on the right bottom, uh, uh, September 14th of last year. And you can see it's a little bit hazy, I think, in the picture. And, and part of that is, is that uh, they just got through with about two months of forest fires constantly in the area. And everything in the area is brown and dry. This is like the worst drought in the area. This is the, uh, um, it's, it's so, so dry. They're just having the worst forest fire season ever. <clears throat> and yet all of these mounds, you can see them on the left and on the right, are lush and green. So um, an important thing to keep in mind. Paddock shift systems. So this is Alan Savory's work in a lot of ways, although not directly Alan Savory. Um, but uh, the idea here is that if you put animals into a paddock and you move the paddock around, this is the number one cure for desertification. And reversing desertification is a big, big part of permaculture. Um, and so I'm... I think that uh, for, for a lot of permaculture systems, using these paddock shift systems where you put animals into the area and move them around, um, it's supposed to be resembling big herds of bison or something like that. It actually works with almost any kind of animal. And a lot of vegans are starting to do this too. Um, and then the, the animals that they keep are going to be more like their pets or something. Um, but then it's like it, it becomes painfully obvious that Mother Nature loves this pulsing of the animals. Uh, typically, uh, you get five times more growth in your vegetation when you use a paddock shift system. Can anybody verify what I'm saying is true? Like they've done it and they've seen five times more growth? Usually there can, there's at least uh, two or three people that will validate what I'm saying. Come on. Come on, somebody. Validate me. <laughs> well, there's the explanation points. Okay, good. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> Good, good, good. Diatomaceous earth. Um, this is a mind powder, so we, we are limited in how much of it there is. Um, so far, there seems to be no end in sight. Um, and the great thing is, is that this is a, a substance that you can eat, and at the same time, if it gets on the outside of a bug, they will die. Um, um, in fact, the people who eat this report all kinds of health benefits, uh, thicker hair, uh, stronger nails. Um, the people that are trying to extend their life to beyond 100 years will eat a tablespoon of this every day. Who's, who's eaten some of this? Sound off. Who's, who's eaten diatomaceous earth on purpose? Like eaten like a tablespoon of it? I have. There it is. Okay. So um, actually almost I'll bet you everybody here has eaten diatomaceous earth. It's, it's mixed in with grains in order to kill the bugs, but of course it's completely edible to us. Um, some is better than others. I've got an article about diatomaceous earth where I try to um, point out uh, uh, resources for the, the best stuff. <clears throat> oh, and then uh, here's, here's kind of a close-up of what it looks like. It's, it's, um, it's fossilized diatoms. Diatoms are little critters living in water, and, we, and they're still alive today. Um, and so I'll link that shit. <laughs> somebody, can somebody point, po put a, a link up on this to my Diatomaceous Earth article, please? Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Oh, more of this. Oh, yeah. See, that's how it works, is that the Diatomaceous Earth looks like a little guy with a sword. <laughs> and he has DE written on his chest, and he stabs bugs. That's, that's how it works. <laughs> Actually, so I should, I should point out that uh, how Diatomaceous Earth does work is that um, it's a desiccant. So there's kind of a couple of different things it does. Is that one, uh, probably the most important one, is, is that it scrapes off. Oh, thank you, Chad. Oh, and Diego got it too. Um, <clears throat> is that it kind of scrapes off the waxy 
coating on the exoskeleton of the bug. And bugs, how they stay alive is that they collect moisture out of the air and store it up inside because they can't get to the little bug drinking fountain. And so if you scrape off some of this waxing stuff, waxy stuff on the exoskeleton, then their innards quickly turn into little bug jerky and they die. Also, um, there's some speculation, and I believe this is true, that the bits of diatomaceous earth are such a fine, fine powder that it looks like little shards up close, and it gets st stuck in their little bug exoskeleton joints and, um, you know, screws them up. All right, Mike Ayler's $50 house. So um, I, I dodged reading this book for 20 years, the $50 and up underground house book, because it had the word underground in it, and I never wanted to live underground. And even the, uh, the picture on the book strikes me as scary. <laughs> but um, uh, I kept reading so many eco-building books that um, uh, referred to this book that I finally went and, and read it just for the sake of being able to see what they were referring to. So, uh, and I was blown away, absolutely amazed. And so this is, this design can be used for an above ground design. And, um, and that's what um, um, the Wafati design is. Actually, it's based on Mike Ayler's designs, but it's an above ground structure. And the engineering in this is amazing. When we start talking about what is good or eco or well aligned with mother nature, um, <clears throat> this design is very much so that um, it's it's a completely different way to build a house, uh, and um, uh, the engineering is sound. Um, uh, it's it's something where it appears to be invisible in nature. Um, it's using local materials, materials dominantly pulled right off of the land. Uh, I, I just can't say enough good things about Mike Ader's design. So I went out to Mike Ader's house in northern Idaho, and I took a video, and this is this uh, up topmost picture is from that video clip, um, and and you can uh, see that this house, uh, um, 40 years later, is still standing strong and and um, doing well. So you would think a $50 house would be something that would um, uh, fall apart pretty easily, but but this is a very well-built, strong, simple home. Um, next slide. Oh, and I've got another video of Mike Ayler's $15 house. So when I took the video, there was a family that had just moved out. A family of three had just moved out of this house. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and they'd been living in it for 18 months. And this house was 30 years old. Um, so, and, and I think when we talk about things that are good and eco and aligned with the earth, that price does does play a factor. I mean, when you go and you see a million dollar home, then there's a million dollars worth of something that was put into it. When we talk about a fifteen dollar home, then we start to think about well, they must have reused some of that glass. The wood had to have come off of the land. And so there's a, a lot of stuff that's rather eco about it. So I think I think the final dollar figure is a is a good indicator for what makes for good eco. We were talking uh, Larry, Larry Santoyo was talking earlier about um, straw bale homes, and um, uh, and then somebody was pointing about like, well, where do you get the straw from? And so it, it's true. A lot of these straw bale homes, they're shipping in the straw bale from a thousand miles away or more. Um, and of course, you can start talking about you know the straw is going to be laced with persistent herbicides like aminopyrrolid, propyrrolid, uh, tordon, things like that. Um, <clears throat> Mike Ayler's greenhouse. Um, I'm not a big fan of greenhouses. Um, however, if you're going to build a greenhouse, this is the design. So um, uh, Mike uh, built his greenhouse in northern Idaho, and it's and if you look at it, you can it's it's not exactly sealed. And that single pane stuff on the roof there, that's not like double pane or anything like that. This this thing is leaky when it comes to it's it's not airtight at all. Um and yet he grew tomatoes in northern Idaho into December, like in the second week of December. Um and so I mean if you just took this design, made it double pane on the top, 
<clears throat> and sealed up the holes, you would get perennial tomatoes without any additional heat. And, and a lot of these greenhouse designs that I see, well, first of all, I've got to say that most uh, greenhouse designs that I see are built in the winter shade, which uh, just drives me crazy that people would do that. But um, uh, outside of that, most greenhouse designs have an alternative form of heat. And I think that might actually take us to our very next slide. Yes. So here we've got one where we're going we're gonna to combine the two. So the idea was, is like, okay, we're going to um, build a good greenhouse, but at the same time, um, we want the temperatures inside to be downright tropical. So um, we're going to add a rocket mass heater into the greenhouse. Very easy to do. You just you just put the uh, exhaust ducting through the the raised bed that would be part of um, uh, that would be that would be part of the um, the Ailer style greenhouse. I've got to stop reading the comments. A Rumford fireplace. The idea is like when you have a fire and you're going to have like eight people sitting around the fire, somebody gets to have smoke in their face. And um, a lot of the heat is goes straight up. Whereas if you put in a Rumford fireplace, it's amazing how um, everybody can be warm. You can even have more people staying warmer with a smaller fire. And very little heat goes up. Nearly all of it goes out into an oval shape. And nobody gets smoke in their face. All right, time for a segue. Oh, the fracking story. Um, Yes, that's right. When you when you do the uh, Rumford, that's radiant heat. That's exactly it. But you got radiant heat with the campfire too. <coughs> so I'm not sure if it even it didn't know it goes. So so here's here's the story. I have a friend uh, from from years ago. I worked with him, and uh, he contacted me and he told me how angry he was about the fracking, and how he's like spending every extra moment outside of work and sleep to um, go and shake his fist at bad guys about fracking, so being part of protests and things like that. And I asked him, how do you heat your home? Well, natural gas. So, of course, the, the key is, is that it's, he's the one that's supporting fracking himself. Anybody who buys natural gas is supporting that whole industry. In fact, in the area where the fracking is going on, where he is so concerned, he feels like he's getting sick because of the fracking. In that particular area, if people stopped buying natural gas for heat, they would stop with all of the fracking because there's just no money in it. So they could go home. They could, they could all, it would be so much easier. Vote with your dollar. If you don't like what they're doing with natural gas, stop paying for it. So um, uh, it just it just seems so bizarre to me that that he was doing it. now of course for a guy like that is he going to use a rocket mass heater probably not he's he's probably going to use either electricity or natural gas and on the other end of the electrical cord is a whole other environmental disaster so um, I that's why I, I really believe that for his particular circumstance for the building that he was in I think a rocket mass heater would have been uh, an excellent excellent solution. Um, combined possibly with um, a backup of electricity, but totally disconnect that gas. Um, yes, he could reduce his electric bill by 87%. That would be another thing that he could work in there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right, moving on. Solar food dehydrators. I, you know what? I think that this is the best way to use solar energy. And um, I, I, there's, there's, of course, you know, photovoltaics. Um, I just don't think photovoltaics has as good of a return on, on investment or effort as solar food dehydrators. And the one that's at the bottom there, as well as the one at the right, those seem to be the most popular designs. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, interesting how they work, but they're just the most effective. In fact, the one in the top left corner, I've been told, has been retired because they just had too many foods that would mold in it. Uh, all right. A double chamber cob oven. So on the left is a standard cob oven, and there's another standard cob oven. There's the Anto Evans, <laughs> and uh, 
Note the smoke all over the front of them, and there's smoke pouring out of the, the top left one right now. And it's kind of like, um, that's that's the big thing that always bothered me about Cobb ovens is, man, they just, the smoke just pours out of the front of them when you're first getting started. So Ernie Wisner on the right has developed this double chamber Cobb oven, so that way uh, it uses less wood, <clears throat> as well as uh, it, um, uh, when it does burn, it burns much, much cleaner, so you're not smoking up the neighborhood. Um, and uh, I've got this full video that, that shows the double chamber cob oven on the right. And, um, and, I, and Ernie and Erica have taken the time to sit down and draw up plans for this. So if you go to uh, permies.com slash stoves, then um, I've got a link there where you can go and buy Ernie and Erica's plans um, uh, for that. Oh, um, <laughs> when you grow your own grain, and, and then it's time to get the little bits of grain out from the chaff, this can be an adventure. And so, uh, um, of course, the old traditional way is to beat it with sticks. But boy, you got to beat it with sticks a long time to get it out. So um, uh, the thing that's uh, 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 amazing here is that Brian Kirkliet has come up with two different techniques on how to thresh your own grain, which for years I had looked around and it was like either you beat it with sticks or you buy a combine. And as impressive as that is, where you take the combine and you park it in your driveway and you go out once a month to kind of wax it to impress the neighbors, this is my combine. <laughs> it cost me a half a million dollars. <laughs> Damn, it looks good in my driveway. So, you know, rather than that, then uh, uh, these techniques that he's come up with are amazingly simple and quick. And it, it just, if you're going to grow grain, then um, this, this is the way to do it. This is the way to thresh your grain. Um, and, and it's also, the video that I have on YouTube also has... Um, uh, a little winnowing example. I think the bottom is the little winnower that he kind of threw together. Uh, so, so much easier, especially for small small scale. And I really like the idea of, of rather than having a farmer with a uh, 100,000 acres, I, I really like the idea that there's going to be um, uh, uh, 10,000 farmers with 10 acres. That just seems far more reasonable to me. So having less acres, you know, uh, having having fewer acres per farmer and more farmers, and and this is the kind of technology I think that really helps to support that. Convert roadkill to chicken feed with maggots. <laughs> this is the part where the the vegans are all going to get really squeamish. <laughs> um, so I've got a rule for farming, and that is that if it smells bad, you're doing it wrong. And so I was sure that this was going to smell bad, but I was standing right there. And I got really close to it. I never s smelled anything. Chad makes a good point. Black soldier fly larva is better. Um, <laughs> vegans are not space aliens. Um, Joel Salatin says, bad, sp bad smell is bad management. But Joel Salatin also composts his chicken awful. And um, it stinks. It smells horrible. Um, and so, and I got to spend the day with Joel the other day, and, and so he and I exchanged a lot of information, and, and uh, I taught Joel Salatin about hugel culture using little, those little creamer cups at the restaurant as we would stack them around and talk about hugel culture, and, 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 and Joel Salatin also said that he has read Sepp Holzer's permaculture book. So, um, all right, but, all right, back, back to the slide here. Uh, uh, yes, this did not smell, and the maggots come at the bottom, and the chickens are hanging around to gobble them up. Um, and so it's it's reusing a valuable resource. I mean, if nothing else, think about all those people that keep talking about, um, and, and the animals could die of things other than roadkill, too. But um, uh, where we're talking about peak phosphorus, I mean, if, if it's a roadkill, where does it go? And that animal is full of phosphorus, and we got to keep our phosphorus on the land. So we got to keep it from going, having all of our phosphorus ending up at the bottom of the oceans, 
and and inside of all of our dumps. This is this is just not going to work. It's not sustainable. Um, a walk-in refrigerator made with a small uh, small insulated room and an air conditioner. So on the far right, you can see this thing gro with uh, glowing red numbers. That's called a cool bot. So basically, this guy has made um, this room. He, the, the, the cool bot fakes out the air conditioner to say, Boy, it sure is hot out. We could use some air conditioning, when in reality, it's not all that hot out. <laughs> But the air conditioner turns on and cools the room, and it just keeps so so basically this cheap air conditioner keeps this treats this room converts this room into something resembling a refrigerator um in fact uh, uh one of the things I like to point out is because sometimes some people are reluctant to be in my videos uh and and I want to point out that the guy that was in my video in this case coolbot contacted him and gave him a lifetime guarantee on his coolbot because they thought the video was so cool. Ah, the Grim Reaper, Brian Kirkliat, showing us how to use a scythe, and um, and and then we talk in the video about how there were there are competitions between a strapping young lad in uh, uh, with a with a string trimmer, the most powerful string trimmer in existence, versus a dainty barefoot girl with a scythe, and the little girl won. So um, uh, it's it's uh, it's amazing, and of course when you when you watch this, oh, and then people comment on the video. What about the barrel? You can't work around the barrel, and it's like, oh no, with a string trimmer, you get up to that barrel and you're hacking the crap out of the barrel. With a scythe, you're cutting only what you want, and you're not hurting the barrel at all. So um, a scythe is so much superior to a string trimmer. It just takes a little knowledge and a little effort. Um, to learn it, and then once you know it, then it's it's you're going to always be faster than a, than a string trimmer. And on top of that, I like Brian's point about how now you can go out and you can do it in your shorts and be barefoot, and you don't end up with slug guts all over your shins. <laughs> slug control with a pile of rocks. So um, I think I think that in permaculture, it is a really smart thing to to maintain lots of piles of rocks. As well of as well as lots of piles of brush. So I've got a podcast with Dave Hunter, the uh, Mason Bee expert, and it's like you know a pile of brush um, will generally support a, a small um, uh, a native bee population, and uh, as well as all kinds of other insects. It's, it's a big insect hotel. Just just brush piles here and there on your property. In this case, uh, a rock pile, and I also talk about a brush pile. In this video, um, and uh, um, it, it supports enough snake habitat that it vastly reduces slug populations. And this is this is in areas where slugs are the garden killers. Um, you just if you if you are in these areas, most people don't garden because the slugs just wipe it out. And unless you've got some sort of slug control system, you're doomed. So um, this is where they're having great success with gardens. And rock piles are their dominant strategy for being able to control the slugs. Colony collapse disorder is solved. It's it's I mean it's no surprise to a permaculturalist. And um, uh, and one of the cards that we have in the um, in the deck of cards out at Kickstarter right now is all about honeybees and listing off a bunch of these techniques. But it's, what it really boils down to is stop torturing the bees. Stop abusing the bees. Stop making the bee your personal bitch and making money. And um, <clears throat> I, I, you know, I'm all for people making money, um, uh, with, with especially with bees. But it's like if you don't respect the bee, the you will Mother Nature will fuck you. And and so in this particular case, um, uh, people are moving these beehives thousands of miles, like with five different trips per year. And you, what you don't think that's going to stress out the bee? You don't think it's going to stress out the hive, um, and uh, then there's things like replacing the honey with uh, sugar water, um, uh, and then of course like, oh no, I've got mites, so I'm going to put in insecticides to kill the mites. But hopefully, I put in just enough to kill the mites, but not kill the bees. Um, and uh, while organic people will use different kinds of things to try and kill the mites, permaculture folks don't use anything. Uh, Treatment-free. Um, I was talking to Jacqueline Freeman the other day. 
and she says she's really trying to push this phrase treatment free using no treatment whatsoever so there's there's a list of things that you can do and when you do these things there's no such thing as colony collapse disorder think about it you know how is it that we survived thousands of years without colony collapse disorder now we bring in all these chemicals and stuff and now we have colony collapse disorder and it, where do you think it comes from all right, this is this is a quickie. This was kind of cool. These these guys bicycled through Missoula, and that's where I live, is Missoula, Montana. They had gone 3,000 miles so far, and the panniers on their bicycles were all made out of kitty litter buckets. And um, we so in this video, uh, we look at the kitty litter buckets, and they're doing great. What a great reuse of something from the garbage stream, and it's doing better than uh, your more conventional, expensive. Um, uh, purchased products would be doing. Cob is an amazing and beautiful material to build with. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, you can shape it into anything. Uh, there's so much. And this is this is a, an image from uh, Cobville in Coquille, Oregon. Uh, what a what a beautiful collection of homes uh, there. I think this might be a, um, a, a screen capture right out of one of my videos from being there. Um, the problem with Cobb is that it's slow, but the upside, of course, is you can shape it into anything. It's a fantastic and beautiful building material. And and um, I, I love the thing that, that I've, I've heard of people that can go to Cobbville, take a weekend workshop, and they have no building skills whatsoever, but they can go and build themselves a home. And um, uh, just what, what an amazing thought. That anybody can build their own home with with uh, just a weekend's worth of knowledge. A cast iron skillet. Um, this this comes from my series of stuff of how to uh, for less toxic living, um, and and it's like the that I think people don't fully comprehend just how toxic the Teflon stuff is, and it seems like uh, every couple of years they come out and they say okay well our last batch was toxic but now we made them not toxic and then two years later you find out oh actually the new batch is even more toxic than the previous batch only it took us this long to figure it out oh well so some people died <laughs> so it goes um the thing is with a cast iron skill with a little bit of knowledge it can be just as slippery so in this video that i put up this is my very first ever youtube video and in this video, I, I show uh, that the egg is uh, uh, sliding around the surface so much, I'm having a hard time getting it onto the spatula so I can flip it over. So um, I've got a massive article about uh, cast iron, um, and it, it goes into a lot of detail about how to select a good pan, um, using the right kind of spatula. Using the right kind of spatula is very important. Oh, good. Heather, thank you for posting the link. Lawn care. Um, I know that uh, uh, Larry said something about lawn care. I just want to express that um, I I like the idea that um, uh, people have a function for lawns, and it's a very good function. And so there's this stuff about food, not lawns. I want to say more food and less lawns, or how about food in your lawns? So I'm a powerful advocate of the concept of the mowable meadow. And, um, and inside your lawn, you grow all kinds of things, and then you can still periodically mow it. This is the place where, are, where our children play. This is the place where we have our yard sales. This is the place where we gather as community, have picnics, et cetera. There's, there's all kinds of things you can do. This is the place where you can come and sit and bask in the glow of what you've accomplished with permaculture. Um, and so I, I really hope that when people are doing their designs, they're not eliminating the lawn. Definitely, most most places where there's lawn, there's way too much, and it's really ugly. And I'd like to just see something that is pulling in the best of all worlds, including having some lawn. Um, <clears throat> my lawn care article is something where it was, it was something that I wrote back in 1994, and it was the first thing I ever put on the internet. Um, and uh, because it was put up so early. Uh, all the search engines uh, thought it was the only thing on lawn care on all the internet. I think for a while it might have been. Um, and uh, I believe that because of this article, 
that I've eliminated several train loads of toxic git from being used because, of course, the mission of the article is to convince people to not use weed and bee, um, to save their money. And um, and that you can and then plus once you've eliminated the weed and feed now you can grow fun things in your lawn like crocuses, you know. So so uh, up here in the north, when the snow finally goes away, crocuses pop out. Then comes the grass. So your whole lawn is this meadow of crocuses when nobody else has anything else growing. It's really amazing. Um, and so I I believe that I've convinced a lot of people to stop using toxic ick. And I think that's part of the mission of permaculture is rather than telling people to stop being bad. You're, you're poisoning everything by poisoning your lawn. Um, stop poisoning it, damn it. That the thing to do is, is to um, convince them to join our side. Like, hey, did you know that if you let that go, you can grow the crocuses thing? And you can do all this other stuff. And then you can water less, and it's less work, and, um, and there's more fun things. OK, so here's, here's another segue. Oh, right, the Wheaton EcoScale. Um, the idea is at level zero, there's six billion people. At level one, there's one billion people. Level two, you can you can read the thing, you can see it all there. And um, then there's uh, two observations that come from this scale. So I I made this scale up because I needed to express a point. And I want to point out that um, uh, every time people see this, they they think that they want to put somebody else at level ten. And um, uh, it's like that's great. Make your own scale. <laughs> you can make up any scale you want. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, Mr. Rogers says it's okay to make believe. So this is entirely make believe. But I got a couple things to point out. My, I've got two observations, and then after the observations, then I've got some some things of like how we can do better. So the observations are that no matter what level you're at, somebody that's one level ahead looks cool. Somebody that's two levels ahead looks really cool. Somebody three levels ahead looks crazy. Somebody that's four levels ahead looks so crazy that they should be institutionalized for their own safety and for the safety of the others around them. All right, so that's, that's an observation. I'm not saying it's good and right. I'm saying it's an observation. Observation number two. Everybody behind you should be hit with sticks. They're fucking everything up, and they need to be smacked around a bit. That's an observation. So I've got this whole um, uh, thing out at permies.com about the, the eco-witch hunt, about a woman who uh, wrote for the uh, Daily Portland newspaper about going green, and she had to finally give it up because she just got too much hate mail from people about you know how she was writing about trying to be green, and um, uh, the, the hate mail was astounding. So um, uh, I, what is Bill Mollison refers to people as um, some sort of like uh, uh, eco-Nazi or something like that. I can't remember his exact words. But uh, the, the, the key is, is that when we go around and we talk about permaculture, oh, thanks, Heather. <laughs> When, when we go around and talk about permaculture, let's try to gauge like what level they're at. Most people are going to be at level zero or level one. And then it might be wise to tell people about things that are at level two or level three. Because beyond that, it's going to sound crazy. Keep in mind, Sepp Holzer, there was a risk at one point in time that um, the, local, the local people, the people in his area, attempted to institutionalize him because he's obviously crazy. The things that he's doing, he keeps calling them farming. And so they attempted to put him into the funny farm. So um, so when we're going around and we're talking to people, it may be wise to try and gauge what level they're at and tell them about things that are just a little bit ahead. Because if you try to talk about things that are too far ahead, it'll sound crazy. Oh, an eco-test. Uh, this this came from watching the movie The Age of Stupid, and um, but it was also combined with a lot of other things that were happening at about that point in time, and it was a lot of environmentalist versus environmentalist. And so in The Age of Stupid, there was one person that was an environmentalist that was trying to um, uh, advocate for wind turbine, turbines for electricity. 
And there was uh, another person that was an environmentalist that was trying to say, no, that's bad. And um, and it's so so basically, I kind of I feel like okay, so I'm I'm going to um, uh, lean upon whatever little authority that I have. I give away more free information about permaculture than all other permaculture people combined. And I've been named the Duke of Permaculture by Jeff Lawton. Um, uh, I, Treehugger.com calls me hardcore green. So I'm going to lean upon all of this authority that I have to say, I made up a test. If you fail the test, you can no longer call yourself an environmentalist. It's a very simple test. A proper test would fill a library. And then the discussion of that test would fill a hundred libraries. So I just made up something that's really basic, really simple, and um, and it's, it goes like this: half the population of the United States of America uses more than the average amount of energy. Half the population uses less. I mean, this is the law of averages. This is mathematically accurate. The average American spends about $1,000 for heat and electricity per adult per year. $250 for electricity without heat. If you spend more than average, you don't get to call yourself an environmentalist. You can go ahead and talk about environmental things, that's great. But when it gets to an argument or when it gets to something where like laws are being written, if you don't pass this test, I revoke your license to call yourself an environmentalist. Um, and by whatever authority that I have, which really amounts to nothing, but but still, I revoke it, and that doesn't really mean anything. I imagine that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be listening to this event right now and are going to fail this test. You don't have to announce that you failed the test. Instead, perhaps, um, we can see a little bit more out of permies.com, and we can talk about some things that could be easy, simple things where you can live an even more luxuriant life and be able to pass the test. A tiny house for $362. Um, the tiny house movement is amazing. Uh, how, how awesome is it to just simply not have rent to pay and not have a mortgage? Um, and uh, uh, so people live in these tiny houses, be really humble. I, I really enjoy the book written by Rob Roy called Mortgage Free, where he talks about the idea of, you know, build this tiny home and, and live in that. So you buy the land with your grub stake. You build a tiny home and you live in that. And then as the years pass, you can build a much larger home, which is exactly what this couple is doing that are in this video. They're building a larger, more luxuriant home for themselves. And at no point did they ever get a mortgage. Fukuoka. Okay, so um, I've been to I don't know how many eco events. And a lot of times I go to these things and I'm just a guy. Nobody has any idea who I am. And, and, and then there'll be somebody who will say, oh, yeah, organic. That's such a fad. You know, um, if, if everybody did organic, three quarters of the world's population would die. And so if any of you ever encounter somebody who says that, I need you to kick them in the nuts because they're a fucking liar. Fukuoka proved that his techniques out produces conventional rice with zero inputs. So he is not putting in any kind of fertilizer fertilizer of any kind, none, no pest control. In the meantime, his next door neighbors are like hosing things down with all kinds of chemicals to pull it out. And of course, the neighbors are saying, oh, we're more productive this way. Bullshit. They're not. In fact, Sepp Holzer's stuff, and you know what? I'm going to get to Sepp Holzer's stuff later. But, but just Fukuoka alone is amazing in so many ways. And I'm, I'm so glad that Larry Korn has uh, translated those books and, and continues to carry on Fukuoka's message. Um, there's, there's so much valuable information from this guy. He's so, so amazing, so excellent. Uh, <clears throat> Earth berm pig shelter cuts feed costs. This woman, she'll, she's got these two hogs. Uh, they're guinea hogs. She's got these two hogs, 
and they're totally loose. Um, they and and she feeds each of them one cup of food a day. And that's all she feeds them. And because they're totally loose, they wander around and find their their own food for the rest of the food that they eat. But the big thing is is that this um, earth berm shelter makes it so that uh, at night they go in there, and because they stay uh, uh, warm at night, they don't need as much food. So animals that are cold at night need more food. But with a shelter like that, they stay so much warmer. Um, this is a kind of a funny thing. I got this video about this refrigerator that doesn't have any power. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, basically they have a spring uphill of them, and then the spring, uh, they've got piping, and the, the spring runs the water through the pipe, and then the, you can see the tubing inside this old refrigerator. And it just, it just keeps this box cool. I, I think they call it a cool box. But, um, uh, and they, you know, they have some cheese stuff that they're doing in there and some milk stuff that they're doing in there. Not stuff that needs to be cold, but definitely does better if it's cool. I, I got comments on YouTube from people that were saying, like, it still uses energy because it has to pump the water. Apparently, they don't understand uphill, gravity-fed water. Uh, apparently, that doesn't make sense to them. They think it still needs to pump. But yeah, this has, this has no power whatsoever. The water continues to flow through here just due, um, just due to gravity. Bringing, uh, it's gravity-fed. This was an interesting thing. I, when I took this video, Jocelyn was with me, and uh, we saw this thing, and Jocelyn said, you should take a video of that. That's interesting. And I said, no! Who wants to see this? This is a shipping container, and they made it into like a little house of sorts. So I, so Jocelyn convinced me. I took the video, I put it up on YouTube, and it turned out to be like one of my all-time biggest hits on YouTube. Um, and and so uh, uh, showing showing once again that Jocelyn is smarter than I am. So uh, the amazing thing is, is in this particular place they have building codes up the wazoo. Um, but at the same time, a lot of the rural properties have a shipping container on them just to store stuff. Um, because it's in the Seattle area, they have lots of shipping containers. So um, on the outside, it looks like a shipping container. And uh, so when your uh, uh, department of making you sad drives by and they look over the fence, they see a storage container. And they don't think anything of it. But uh, it's an, uh, a refrigerator container. So the walls are insulated, and uh, it actually, I think it's uh, R35, which is about the same as a straw bale house, only this is something that was plucked out of the waste stream. So the, the insulation in it is so good that it stays comfortable inside. Um, and I, th I think that it turned out rather nice in there. It, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's not like a... Uh, a super fancy log cabin or anything, but but it's and so the family lived in it for several years while they built their own home, and uh, now it's intern habitat. <laughs> Step Holzer's bone sauce. Um, so the idea is is that if you take these two cast iron pots, and you fill the top pot with bones, and you put a screen between the two pots, and you put a little bit of water in the bottom pot. Then you build a fire over the two pots, and they're kind of buried this way. Um, uh, the next day, you open it all up, and you dig the goo out of the bottom. And that goo, when you put it onto trees, it'll keep animals from eating it. So now here, like one of the biggest expenses of planting trees in, in this area is that the deer will eat them all. And uh, uh, so people have been having excellent results. I, I made a video of Sepp Holzer's bone sauce um, uh, a few months ago, and I put it up, and a lot of people have been uh, trying that and having great luck with it. Um, and it, it really does keep uh, the animals off the trees, so the trees can grow to adulthood rather than being consumed by uh, uh, deer. And the big thing for me is that it dramatically reduces the uses of plastic when people transplant trees. And um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you, well, I'm going to get to it later, I think. Um, but I, I just kind of think that, uh, yeah, the use of plastic when transplanting trees is such a, such a terrible waste. Oh, yeah, here's, here's a, um, slides out of the video, and, and you can kind of see they're getting ready to start 
they um, they flip the the second pot over onto the first pot. Then they build the fire, and then you can see the brown goo. <laughs> and then and then Sep Sep will get some of the brown goo on the end of a stick, and he'll offer it out for you to smell it to see what it smells like. Don't fall for it, because as soon as you go in for the sniff, he dabs it on your nose. He's a rude bastard. It smells like um, like like you've cleaned the grill on a barbecue. Like like here's a barbecue that hasn't been used in a couple of months, and you're gonna go clean all that stuck on stuff off of the grill. It smells like that. Okay, here we go. This is something I was gonna bring up earlier, but I'm glad I didn't. Apple trees from seed. So um. <clears throat> There's there's this myth going around that if you try to grow apples from seed, then uh, there's a one in twenty thousand chance that you'll have an edible apple, and and that that myth is founded on a speck of truth. There's a one in twenty thousand chance that you're going to grow an apple that can outcompete Macintosh in the open marketplace, like in like in a supermarket. That it'll be the next big, great, fantastic apple. Um, <clears throat> there's a 20% um, a chance that the apple will be an excellent apple. There's also a 20% chance that the apple will be what's called a spitter. Um, and so I think you can probably figure out what that means. Uh, and and then you know there's like the remaining percentages, 60% chance that uh, the apple will be okay. It'll be um, good for one thing, but not very good for juice. It'll be great for eating fresh, but you know, not for applesauce. It'll be good for one thing, but not another thing. And um, and of course, all the apples make great pig feed and animal feed. Um, but if, if it's like you got if an apple tree, if you plant a seed and an apple tree pops up and you don't like it, well then just cut it down. You know, there, you plant. I mean, seeds are so crazy cheap and easy to come by. Then um, there's plenty more where that came from. Not a big worry. Uh, the reason why you want to do it is that then your apple tree will have a tap root. And in the permaculture world, I think we all know the value of a tap root in a tree. So I hope everybody will start planting a lot of apple trees from seed. And let's let's really experience apples from a tree the way Mother Nature intended, instead of this Frankenstein thing where we graft one kind onto another kind and then we start ripping them up out of their roots which loses the tap root and then planting that. Um, the other interesting thing about apple trees is that both Holzer and Fukuoka came to the same conclusion of stop pruning. If you if you grow it um, from, from tiny till big without ever pruning it then um, it won't get addicted to pruning. Whereas at Fukuoka I'll prove that if you try to stop pruning a tree that's already been pruning, pruned for all of its life, then that tree will die. But um, a tree, uh, an apple tree, looks a, a lot more like a shrub um, with big branches along the ground. Um, so uh, it's it's a great place. It's a, it's 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 something to add to your. Oh, that's right. The uh, Antonovica cultivars are generally fairly stable. So it's true, that's a, that's a variety that's grown a lot in Russia and is usually the rootstock that's used for um, your full-size trees when they do graft, um, but it's usually very true to parent, um, but, uh, but most other apple varieties are not. Oh, Dan Rojas Mosquito Traps. So this, is, this is a YouTube channel called Green Power Science. Dan Rojas is um, a, a great a great guy. He's doing lots of stuff with solar and whatnot. But this particular case is like, because I keep hearing about people that have all these mosquito problems. They're spraying all this toxic gick all over themselves, and then, and then they'll like you know pack the air full of toxic gick and toxic, 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 all for the sake of controlling mosquitoes. Now, of course, a great long-term solution is to um, create a lot of habitat for controlling uh, the, or Create a lot of habitat for the things that like to eat mosquitoes. Um, but failing that, here's a simple thing: fan and screen. Just magnets hold the screen onto the fan. You turn the fan on, and then the thing just packs up with a gazillion mosquitoes. 
and you're done. Um, and the funny thing is, he says that when he goes and he collects up the mosquitoes, usually it's just legs because other creatures have come through and eaten all the bodies. <laughs> Farmstead Meatsmith is coming to Montana. We're going to do a workshop, a uh, rocket mass heater workshop and Farmstead Meatsmith workshop out here in Montana. Um, but these videos are amazing. Can somebody post a link to the first video on YouTube that... Um, uh, I, so we, I worked on a deal. I'm now hosting the Farmstead Meatsmith beautiful, amazing, spectacular videos on my YouTube channel. I'm so honored to be able to do this. Um, the, uh, um, I think, first of all, do we, do we have any um, vegans on here right now? Um, so go ahead and shout out if you're a vegan. I, I'm, I'm really, I'm really curious. So we got a veggie. I, I think that, um, I wonder that if you go and watch just the first video, I think a lot of vegans, which I believe are a very noble people, um, uh, their, their reasons for being vegan, sometimes it's for health reasons, but sometimes it's for ethical reasons. And, um, and they've seen those videos of like the slaughterhouses and stuff. And it's like, I think that would turn anybody's stomach. And I think that um, a lot of vegans, if they watch this, I think that probably half the vegans that watch it would say, I would eat that meat. And, and it's like, there's such a powerful message about the relationship between people and the animals that they raise and the meat that they eat. And this, this thing, paints such an amazing and beautiful picture of that. I, I really hope that, that people will, will watch these videos. Oh, and then of course the point is the chopping block. Um, the chopping block that's here is, has never seen bleach. It's washed with salt. And so as a result, good bacteria build up in the wood of the chopping block. And then that bacteria uh, um, makes it so that it preserves the meat that touches the chopping block. This is this is a component for when you get those hams that are going to be like three years old before you eat the ham. So this is food preservation. This is getting meat to last even decades. Um, there, there's a uh, I remember a story about how. Uh, in some region, when girls were born, they would um, put up a ham. And that is the ham that they would serve on that girl's wedding day. So, roughly 20 years old. Um, you know, And they're a good reason to get those women to be married off so you could have the ham. Because it gets to be so delicious when it gets to be that old. Raw milk. I've uh, How many people have heard the um, podcast I did with Sally Fallon Morell on raw milk? Probably one of the top five podcasts I've ever done. Um, and uh, um, some of the stories are like there's a there's a guy. He's uh, not only is he dying of cancer, he's in the uh, ICU, and um, uh, he's got like hours, maybe a day, left to live. And somebody sneaks in fresh raw milk and gives it to him. I mean, he's going to die in a couple of hours anyway. What the hell? Total recovery. Complete recovery. Um, so now, let's suppose that you make lots of money on, on this cancer treatment stuff. And uh, you find out about how raw milk is the total cure for cancer. Um, what might you do? Oh, that's right the exact things that happen in that movie, Farmageddon, where they go and they track down people who are selling raw milk and fuck up their shit. Through the government, of course. Our favorite weapon is government. So um, I, th I think there's, there's a lot of amazing, and a lot of people that are concerned about how they're lactose intolerant, I think you might discover that you're not lactose intolerant, but what you are is pasteurization intolerant. Might want to give it a try. All right. Oh, this is funny. So we made a rocket stove at this workshop. And this is 
these pictures are actually taken out of the DVDs that are that I'm selling now that we just got finished with. Um, and uh, <laughs> this was wild. We, the guy comes by and he looks at it and he's a blacksmith. And he says, "Ah, that looks so hot. I I imagine that we could like melt some steel in that. That looks like forge temperatures in there." So we started to fool around with it, and sure enough, uh, not only did we reach forge temperatures, but but we exceeded forge temperatures. So this guy was talking about how he's got this great big old forge that has an enormous fan on it, and he has to buy all this coal in order to make it run. And then um, uh, and he's like. But we're reaching forged temperatures with just some sticks, and I don't even have to use a fan. So um, this was just a really cool thing that, um, and it was just it was just a fluke, just a fluke that we did this at all. But it's inside the, it's inside the um, the uh, the video, the DVD that we call Hot Rocket. I have a video up on YouTube um, for free um, uh, on electric tractors. So this is Steve Hackeroth, the electric tractor guy. Uh, Steve Hackeroth has done so many amazing things in the world of permaculture, but I think this is his version 12 electric tractor. Oh, and it's a solar electric tractor. Steve Hackeroth uh, has the, um, his name is on the patent of the solar panels that show up in the background in one of these slides. Um, so uh, uh, Steve Hackeroth has also done, uh, well, anyway, the work that he's done is amazing. I think I've got like... Um, I don't know, five or eight podcasts with Steve Heckeroth, like probably a total of maybe 12 hours of podcasts just talking to Steve Heckeroth and, and his amazing contribution to the world of permaculture. But um, uh, the electric tractor is amazing. Like with an electric car, one of the problems that you have is that um, you have limited range. Like you can only go like 150 miles before you need to recharge. But with an electric tractor, you um, if you've got like, you know, 100 acres, well, you're never going all that way far, all that far from your charging spot. Um, on top of that, you know, it's totally solar. By the way, here at, at my farm, uh, we've got two electric vehicles so far. We got more coming, and they're all solar powered. And um, so, you know, for those of you that happen to pop out here, make sure you get to have a, a a little bit of time poking around on the electric vehicles um, and stuff. And and uh, but anyway, uh, another great thing about electric tractor is that uh, if you use lead acid batteries. They provide an extremely low center of gravity. Plus, people that own diesel and gasoline tractors, they will usually fill those great big tires in the back with a calcium solution to give the tractor weight and thus traction. Um, but with an electric tractor with lead-acid batteries, you've got all the, all the weight you need, all the traction that you need. He kept building these tractors and finding out that there's all this empty space in the tractor. So his tractors kept getting smaller, but the amount of power that they put out is greater. So this tractor here, we uh, we talk about how this tractor can do the same work as a 45 horsepower diesel tractor, but this is much much smaller. Okay, um, here's a, this is where Larry Santoyo, who might still be around, will get really angry with me, because <laughs> basically this message is kind of the opposite of what he was saying. And so I want to point out that um, uh, uh, permaculture, I believe, is a broad umbrella, and there are many schools of thought. But um, uh, so on the right, we've got um, the Holmgrenian approach, which is where we've got the ethics at the center, and then we've got the principles surrounding that. And this is the foundation for permaculture. Whereas with Sepp Holzer, then um, he advocates the techniques and then, um, and but he's also got his own thing. It's, notice how there's a lot of observe in the Holzerian technique, and one of them is profit, which I I, I believe is an important thing. But um, it's more like here's a bunch of things that you do, and then by the way, when you're all done, you just happen to have signed up for a big ethics package. The ethics are built into the things that you do, so you end up with it. I know that at permies.com, um, I would say that. I, I'm, I'm trying to think if there may have been a time ever when something was going icky and somebody brought in the three ethics and things went good. I I can't think of one, but I can think of probably 20 or 30 times when things were icky and or 
things were perfectly fine, I'm going to go with that example, things were perfectly fine and good and wholesome and decent, and somebody brought in the ethics and made it horrible. And um, so from a practical standpoint, I'm not, I personally am not seeing the ethics earning their keep in the permaculture toolbox. Um, and I've seen things where things were bad and people brought in the ethics and made them much worse. Um, so I, I kind of feel like um, the ethics are great for um, thought experiments. And of course, people have been arguing about ethics for um, millennia. Um, and so it's something where it's a, it's a very uh, difficult and awkward thing. But when it comes to getting things done and moving forward and building community and improving communication, so far the ethics have been um, a big negative in my world. Uh, um, so, and then a lot of people, when I tell them that, then they say, oh, Paul Wheaton doesn't have any ethics. And it's like, okay, if that's the way you want to play it, that's fine. Um, but I, I do think that there's a lot to be said for when you learn a lot of different permaculture techniques and then you start to practice them and embrace them and then you've given up on Monsanto and you've given up on, on using toxic geck and, and you move to something that's more productive, but then I think you just so happen to have, have brought the ethics along with you on accident. The cult and permaculture. Oh, in fact, I want to ask Larry about this um, because I heard the, of an expression that Larry uses, which I thought was just magnificent. And and the expression that he used, I heard, um, is uh, purple breathers. And, and, and so I want to hear more from Larry about what does that mean? <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I've, we've started over at permies.com talking about purple versus brown. And uh, a lot of that is found a, founded on this rumor of something that Larry said. And uh, some people, it's like they believe that, that permaculture is um, uh, like a, a, an important um, part of it is a certain type of pol political thing. Um, uh, like you have to be signed up for this political party in order to be in permaculture. Um, other people believe that you, in order to be part of permaculture that you have to be pagan or something pagan-esque. Uh, and, and then the, the whole thing about like the fairies and um, um, and a big part of permaculture is holding hands and singing songs. And it's like, I, I think that there are some people out there that, that truly, ooey believe that that is true. And I'm willing to say that it's okay for them to think that. I'm, I'm, I'm all right with that. The problem I have is when they tell me that because I'm not doing that, then I'm not doing permaculture. And um, I have verified it with the powers that be that, no, you get to practice permaculture without the cult in permaculture. And on top of that, I think that when you get certified by PRI to teach that um, you are required to teach a course that is purple free. And, and so um, I, 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 I just want to, to I, I think permaculture is going to move forward more and be more accepted and end up in more homes when we leave behind the purple. And I think um, uh, people that want to do um, um, purple with their permaculture and call the purple part of the permaculture, I think that that's fine. And, um, but I th at the same time, I wholeheartedly support people that practice permaculture without any of the purple. And um, again, you know, power vested in me, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Polyculture, one of the biggest powerhouses in all of permaculture. And so, um, boy, I want to do my charity goodness speech, uh, but but basically, um, I'm going to try and ra wrap this up in 60 seconds, and that is the idea that um, it was only a few years ago, ago that we learned about beta carotene and how important beta carotene is in our food. And um, uh, where does it come from? How do plants acquire beta carotene? Why do some plants have more than others, etc.? And so then that became a, a big field of research for a long time. Um, I believe that there are thousands and possibly infinite numbers of different kinds of nutrients that are good for us that we have not yet found a label for. And that a lot of this comes from their polyculture interactions. And so um, uh, 
a rhubarb plant next to a carrot, uh, next to an oak tree, next to a dandelion, they all exchange things. They all exude different things, and they all take in different things. And it is through polyculture, which is the most important nutrient source for a plant. Um, and, and this is something where I can wax on for many, many hours. And so this is just a, a quick taste. Um, poop and pee as a resource instead of a pollutant. I, um, uh, w just before I presented this in San Diego last March, uh, there was an excellent uh, a presentation on uh, urine as, uh, as a, a nutritive resource. Basically, urine is a nearly perfect fertilizer. I mean, um, uh, by conventional fertilizer measurement, but it, it, it has an amazing amount of nutrients for plants in it. Um, now granted, some plants can't take that up too well because it's, it's a little too strong, but there are a lot of plants that can take it up perfectly well. And uh, so uh, when you go out and you pee in a spot, you've just created edge, permaculture edge, yay! <laughs> Some plants can take in a little bit. Some plants can take in a lot. So, um, and and it, it turns out that poop doesn't have a lot of nutrient value in it, a little bit, but not a lot. Not as much as pee. And uh, it's important to keep them separate. Um, and I can talk for hours about that one too. But um, uh, I think it's important to use it as a resource instead of a, a pollutant. Right now, it's like uh, here in Missoula, um, I've got hours of podcasts where we talk about where does our poop go? And um, then the Missoula Wastewater Treatment Plant kind of um, extracts the poop Kool-Aid and puts it into the river. And um, I don't think that that's a good thing. I, I, I want us to have a better system than that. Um, and, and of course, it's, it is treated as a pollutant. And, and it's like, how do we mitigate the pollution? And it's kind of like, you know, I think the first way to mitigate it as a pollution is to start treating it as a resource and using it properly and safely. There are ways. Okay. So I'm going to try and keep my calm. Um, uh, the CFL has got to be one of the biggest toxic shit storms ever to enter somebody's home. Um, these things are toxic during their manufacture. They're toxic during their use. And they're toxic during their disposal. A lot of people are only familiar with how they're supposedly toxic during the disposal, but I think that they just don't know how toxic they are during their disposal. Um, the incandescent light bulb, which is now being banned uh, in the United States, it's already been banned in many other countries. Actually, Canada is reversing their ban. They are finally figuring out that the CFL is a toxic shitstorm, and that the incandescent has always been awesome. Here's here's an amazing thing about, oh, thanks again, Heather, for posting the link to my article. Uh, Humanor Handbook um, has a lot of good information in it, but the hu but there's a lot of things I don't agree with in the Humanor Handbook. And so we've got lots of podcasts that go into detail about that. An incandescent light bulb, here's an amazing thing. In Montana, where I live, I tend to turn on my lights in the winter. And the thing that they're complaining and bitching about, about the incandescent light bulb, is that not enough light per watt is given off, and all that extra power is just released as heat. Huh. I'm using that light bulb in the winter when I need heat, and it happens to give off, what's that called? Uh, heat! So it turns out that if you if you illuminate your home in the winter time when it's cold outside, you know, a lot because it gets dark early, then your heater doesn't come on nearly as often because your house has been warmed by these incandescent lights. How convenient is that? It's uh it talked about stacking your functions. And for those of you that don't live in Montana, when it's winter and night, is it still a little cool outside? Could you use a little extra heat? So, um, but all right, I've got the big long article. I've made two videos about this. The CFL 
is a horrible, terrible thing. I don't understand how it's been divided down these political lines. Why are liberals protecting it, and why are conservatives um, fighting it? Um, it's like it seems like it would be the other way around, and and um, it's it's really weird that it's a, become a political thing. Um, I want the people who call themselves environmentalists to be against the poisons, the sickness, lies, and wickedness behind CFLs. All right. On a lighter note, here is a fence made from pallets. It's not even attached to the ground. And as anybody who has made fence for animals knows, the most difficult animals on a farm are pigs, and number two is goats. Pigs will like lift fence up and just rip it out and go underneath it. Goats will climb over everything. Goats, goats are perpetually testing all fences. But this simple fence made out of pallets, free pallets, and even the screws used to hold them together, she says she got for free. This whole fence was built for free. This fence holds in goats and pigs, and it just sits there. You could lift the fence up and move it somewhere else. <laughs> All right, so this is a cute little video I made, and I put it up on YouTube, and it shows a jumping spider on my monitor, and it's uh, it's chasing my little mouse pointer. And so now I've got spider venom in my monitor because the spider kept biting the mouse. Um, the thing is, is that uh, uh, many, many years ago, like 20 years ago, I got bit by a brown recluse spider. That was miserable, and I don't want it to ever happen again. And at the time, my policy on spiders was all spiders must die um, and and a lot of it came from the fact that every once in a while a spider would start a web like right over my head or right over my arm and then suddenly it would be on me and I don't know that kind of freaks you out doesn't it, it just kind of makes you jump out of your skin so um, I had perpetual flies in my house and all kinds of other little bugs and uh, then I got bit by the brown recluse spider. So I changed my policy to be more aligned with nature. So now I leave all jumping spiders and daddy long legs in my house. And they consume all the spider food. So now I don't have little bugs and, and flies in my house. Those, there, there's just none. And I don't, and since this, these spiders come and eat up all the spider food, there's no reason for a brown recluse to move in. So I've not been bitten since, but I, you know, getting bit by a brown recluse is typically a once-in-a-lifetime kind of a thing. But uh, this is my general policy, and it has worked out amazingly well. A tea lud. Okay, let's see if I can say this correctly. A top-lit updraft stove. Ah, I got it right on the first try. All right. So this is an interesting little contraption. Um, they poke holes in the bottom of the can, and air comes up through the, the fuel source, the wood, and then you set it on fire on the top. And so it basically burns the gases that are given off. So it's a very clean burn, and then it leaves behind charcoal, which you can use for all your charcoal needs. Um, I, I've got a video about it, the top-lit updraft stove. Sealing a pond with a liner. So this is the Earthworks uh, project that we did down in San Diego. Um, and while we did not get a chance to seal this pond, um, there was a fair bit of clay in this material, although I think it might have been actually a higher in silt. But um, there's enough clay. Um, and, and we dug the pond um, in a day. And, we, and the next day, we wanted to make the pond even bigger. But, um, but Mother Nature reigned. <laughs> and filled the pond before we had a chance to really properly seal it. But um, uh, somebody, somebody once asked, I was at an event, and Sepp Holster was speaking, and somebody asked the question, um, you know, what kind of liner do you use when sealing a pond? And Sepp said, I grade your question with an F. So the mission is to seal a pond without a liner. And in this particular case, the thing that we would have done um, if it didn't rain, is that we would have taken the track hoe through there, and we had a, we had a track hoe, uh, an excavator, 
and you put the smallest bucket you can on the biggest track hoe you can, and then you uh, go around and you compress the bucket into the ground, and that compacts the soil under the bucket, thus making the seal. That's, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, we could we could spend an entire day talking about different ways to seal a pond without a liner and all the ups and downs and ins and outs, but in a nutshell, that's most of it right there. This is an inter so transportation is an issue, but but this is this kind of comes back to the top lip updraft stove, and and what they're doing is that they're heating wood, and then a um, a gaseous material comes off. So a, I don't want I'm trying to avoid the wor the word gas because you think gasoline, but it's um, a, a gaseous gas comes off of the wood and is exuded from the wood, leaving behind charcoal. And then, uh, kind of like uh, biogas or propane or something like that. And then that is used to fuel the truck. So this guy has put in thousands of miles driving around in this truck. And and I think he you know, he stops and he'll pick up a cord of wood once in a while and he'll fill the back of his truck with, with wood. And, um, man, who is this Heather Merch person? Putting all these links in every time I mention something. Awesome. <laughs> so, um, uh, syngas is one of the yes. I think I think uh, um, that's a that's a good way of putting it. So, uh, uh, I just think that this is a rather brilliant way. Now, I've heard it can kind of gum up your engine a little bit, so there might be ways to mitigate that. But this is an, a great path to go down. I mean. Um, it, it's a very clean burning sort of thing. It's not wood smoke. Anything that would be smoke is is left inside the charcoal, so it burns extremely clean as it goes down the road. I think it's something worth learning more about because um, uh, wood is a renewable resource. Uh, we can get more of it. It grows so quickly and easily in some areas. And this is another one that I think is like um, not yet perfect, but on its way, and um, just compressed air, S simply storing compressed air. Uh, they've got tanks. They used to have a problem where the tanks, if, if you were in a car crash, that the, the tank would explode, thus making your, your little car crashes, your little fender benders, possibly like really awful. Um, but they've come up with new tanks that will simply crack and instead of, you know, do the explodey thing. Um, and so I, I kind of think that there's a lot of room for optimization here. A lot of this, this has got a lot of potential. I like the idea of compressed air. These these vehicles so far are able to get um, uh, mileage. Like the efficiency is about the same as a battery powered car, um, and and the the distance that they're able to go is about the same and stuff like that. But I think that while we've been putting a lot of effort into batteries for transportation, this is something that could use a lot more attention. Huh. Poolis sounds like a uh, uh, something where you're going to gain a lot of weight, doesn't it? So, um, poolis is the idea of not using soap and shampoo in the shower. So you still shower just as often, only it turns out that all of your body funk that is of a concern is entirely water soluble. So um, there is no need for soap or shampoo. The people that have gone down the Poulos Road um, have generally experienced uh, longer, thicker hair. Um, uh, uh, one guy emailed me, and um, and he said that he had gone 20 years with nearly daily migraine headaches, and once or twice a week he would either black out or vomit from from the migraines. And um, and then he heard my podcast about going poolless. He tried it, and he hasn't had a migraine since. So whatever toxic gick was in his soap or shampoo in the shower was the source for his migraine headaches. Um, I know that a bunch of us have – I've been poolless now for over two years, um, and I've stopped using all deodorants. And uh, Jocelyn, who has an extremely sensitive smeller um, and is always quick to point out who in the room stinks, uh, apparently I have passed her tests for odor. So a lot of people have reported that they've stopped using deodorants, that somehow your natural bio whatever's come back and um, 
you don't stink anymore. So um, Jocelyn, after a year and a half of me being clueless, Jocelyn finally tried it. And she is extremely particular about shampoo stuff and things like that and skin stuff and hair stuff. And, and she is extremely happy with, with this path. And I think on, uh, on Permuse, we've got a massive thread about it. And Heather's already posted a link, of course. And uh, damn, she's good. And uh, uh, a lot of very, very happy people uh, talking about fine tuning as well as, you know, just being extremely happy traveling this path. Okay, this is probably the teeniest, tiniest of, of the bricks in this presentation. And um, I've just, I just had gone through so many different coffee makers. I, I kind of went to making cowboy coffee. Like I, my, my French press broke again. It was like the fifth time that the glass broke. I'm very insistent on using glass, not plastic. And um, so I lost the glass carafe again, or the, the little thing that, that, that makes the French press work. So I needed to make coffee that morning, and so I just made cowboy coffee in this glass Pyrex um, measuring cup, and uh, which is where you just mix hot water with um, the coffee grounds and let it sit for a while. Only then I poured it through a strainer, which somebody pointed out to me that does that does that make it cowgirl coffee? So I suppose I suppose this is cowgirl coffee, um, but the coffee I believe is excellent. It's extremely simple, and on top of that, I don't think that Pyrex container is going to ever break, and I think that the little strainer is never going to break, and there's this less material in general. This is an extremely simple thing that I think will last for life. No more buying coffee makers for me. Um, and of course, the best thing to do is don't ever start drinking coffee. I, I, I have to confess that I am coffee's bitch for life, and um, I, I think I would have been a smarter person if I just never started drinking coffee to begin with. No more compost piles. Um, so a, a lot of gardeners, I mean, they believe compost is the magic stuff. Uh, Jeff Lawton's videos about soil, he spends a lot of time making compost. Um, uh, I, I just, I've got a couple of different podcasts where we go into a lot of detail about this, including with Helen Atow who is the most advanced composter I've ever met, and now she doesn't compost at all. Um, for you know the, the exact same reasons that I have. Uh, and, and, it, and so basically, um, when you start off with a bunch of raw material for a compost pile, and you pile it all up, then it becomes 10 to 20 times smaller. So um, far, 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 far smaller. And it's kind of like, well, where did all that material go? And it turns out that all that carbon and nitrogen goes up into the atmosphere. Um, so the nitrogen, of course, 80% of our atmosphere is already nitrogen. Um, but that carbon goes up as different kinds of greenhouse gases. So congratulations, you're fucking up the planet. You're contributing to the greenhouse gas problem uh, by composting. Now granted, the material that you end up with is some really magical, awesome stuff. But all that carbon and nitrogen would be so much more useful in our soil rather than going up into the atmosphere. So um, uh, Ruth Stout's techniques are where she'll pick up a slab of mulch and throw her compostables under that and slap the mulch back down. So it still breaks down, and only now it's far more likely to end up sticking into our soil rather than going up in the atmosphere. Um, uh, microbials and different kinds of plants and stuff will be able to take it in. Another thing is, is that when you've got a full farm ecosystem or you've got a full permaculture system, then um, uh, where are your compostable materials? All of your kitchen scraps go out to different animals. And then the animals, you keep moving your shelters all the time, so there's no accumulation of poop. So um, there's nothing to compost. So um, uh, this is uh, uh, my, you know, I, I can go on for hours about why to not compost. Granted, compost is an amazing thing. But there are reasons to stop it, to not do it anymore. All right, so a segue. <laughs> this is uh, somebody made. I, I mentioned, I said this in the podcast. I was reviewing uh, Farmageddon, and I said this, and uh, somebody made it into a meme, and it went crazy on Facebook. And I had a bunch of people saying, "Prove it, prove it, prove it." Which I, I kind of think this is so easy to prove. Why do you need to? Like anybody who says, "Prove it," um, is a dumb fuck. I mean, I'm not your, I'm not your fucking Google mommy. 
Um, when you take away the Kim Ag subsidies and the organic ag penalties, Kim Ag food will cost the consumer nearly four times more. So um, it's it's so simple. I, I I went and I looked up. You hit Google and you look up. Um, I looked up corn subsidy, and it was like um, uh, 20 seconds later. I'm looking at something that's telling me about how just the corn subsidy, the direct corn su corn subsidy, is 75 to 80 percent. And that's not taking into account like the hundred other subsidies which impact the corn industry. So um, just for that one food item, it was like, and what's uh, corn stuff is in 70% of Americans food. So um, no, it's, it's, this is, um, I, I think that this is a very important thing. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know what, and I want to, I want to turn it around. If somebody believes that, um, that this might be not true, I want them to prove it, prove that it's not true. I want you to list all the possible subsidies that impact all the possible foods, not just the federal subsidies, um, you know, all, all of the state and county subsidies as well. And don't forget food stamps. That's, a, that's actually an ag subsidy there. So, you know, work in all those subsidies. Let's see how it is. And then, of course, don't forget to work in the organic ag penalties, all the paperwork that they have to do in order to be organic. And then, of course, you know, the actual money they have to pay in order to be organic. So um, prove it bitches. So um, uh, moving along. A stack of rocks. I mean, earlier we talked about stack of rocks as slug control, but then there's also this concept of an air well. And so what happens is, is that when you're in a space, and this is a fresh stack of rocks, so it doesn't show it, but um, when, when you're in a place that's very hot, um, especially hot and humid, what will happen is you have this big stack of rocks, and the rocks on the inside are pretty cool. As the warm, moist air moves through that stack of rocks and they hit those uh, bits of colder rocks, water condenses on the colder rocks, and it drips into the ground. So it's great to have uh, trees planted near stacks of rocks. Watch your profanity. You're offending the children I'm planning to have. <laughs> I'm, I'm making them tougher so they can write good poetry when they're older. Um, natural swimming pools. This is, this is something that's gotten us huge amounts of traffic at, at Permies. Um, and uh, uh, what, an, what an amazing thing. I mean, uh, the whole idea of being in a chlorine pool is so alien and weird. Um, and and it, it's like then you just you learn about what is chlorine and and now you're like just um, um, being poisoned. I mean chlorine is just generally a general poison. So you get out of a chlorine-based pool, haven't you been poisoned a little bit? Um, are you a lesser person now? Or are you going to be more susceptible to other toxins now? Um, so this this idea of a natural swimming pool is so so simple. Just move the water through a bunch of plants. That's all it is. And then the soil under those plants, of course, has all kinds of microbial life going on. And uh, the water stays stays clear and clean and beautiful and does not smell like chlorine. It smells like beautiful life. Ah, build a better mousetrap. So um, I was at this house. And I saw a mouse go by, and they didn't have a mouse trap. So I grabbed a bucket and a two-by-four and a spoonful of peanut butter, and in 20 minutes, the first mouse was in there, and then I went to bed, and when I got up in the morning, there were two mice in there. So um, this is something, uh, I, I did this because I read about, like, in some place in Africa, they did this with rats. They would get a 55-gallon barrel and um, basically do the exact same thing, and it would just fill with rats. So now... You got to keep in mind too that that um, you know mice and rats are part of nature, and so we need to find a way to be more aligned with them. Of course, our homes are kind of taken out of nature, and um, we can live a more luxuriant lifestyle if we um, control our mice without the use of nature. Flea control. So right now, if you Google flea control, I think I'm currently number one. Um, my article, I think, comes up number one. And uh, should we time Heather to see how quickly she can get this link up? <laughs> because, 
because uh, boy, she is on top of it. Um, so anyway, uh, um, right now, I think a lot of you, especially in the warmer regions, you might be. How many of you are currently fighting fleas? And now my now the link that Heather got up is going to be zipping zipping by. But um, Heather, you might not might want to save that that link. OMG, yes. <laughs> so um, uh, fleas. Uh, first of all, I want to say that that um, uh, fleas are nothing more than a minor nuisance. Um, I, so the first step is don't panic. So that's where this image comes from in the in the middle. Um, so the woman's panicking because there's fleazilla coming after her. Um, some people have some uh, minor allergies to fleas. In fact, anytime you've got a little flea bite, that's showing your allergy, actually. Um, uh, but they can be so easily controlled with natural means. In fact, um, a, rather, a lot of people go out and they'll get the flea bombs, and they will basically, which basically poisons the entire house. So now there's a layer of poison on everything in your house. You touch a cupboard, it's got poison on it. Um, and so, and it's, it's toxic to you. It's not toxic to just the fleas. So diatomaceous earth is, of course, uh, one of the big tools in the tool set for controlling fleas. But, but really, it's your brain. And um, you need to be able to understand the flea life cycle. And um, I, my article goes into great detail about that. And um, uh, I think that um, there are some other techniques, but, but really it's about uh, um, understanding. I, I was in a household, a community house, and uh, I, I had just driven away from the house to go on a week vacation. I ended up cutting my vacation short and coming back because everybody in the house, they found fleas. They discovered fleas, like five or six of them. And everybody in the house was utterly convinced. Uh, and this kind of comes back to Larry Santoyo's thing. Don't believe the fear mongers. Um, so everybody in the house was utterly convinced that they were going to die of the plague. Um, and because, of course, the plague comes from having rats that have the plague. The flea bites the rat, and then the flea bites you. And now you have the plague, and yeah, you could die from the plague. Now, it's true that there is still plague in the United States. Um, about five or six cases are reported each year, and the people who get the plague are nearly universally people who are currently studying the plague in these extremely remote patches of desert where there are still a few rodents that have the plague. That's it. That's that's the so so the odds of you getting the plague from a flea bite in your home is less than you being elected president of the United States and then being struck by lightning on your inauguration day. So um, you're, you're not going to get the plague. Just, so first off, don't panic. Um, there are a variety of techniques we can use to get rid of fleas, and, and it's um, a, a cakewalk, really. Understanding the life cycle. A bee hut. So um, this is a bee hut that I made, um, I don't know, like 10 years ago or so. Uh, this has three hives in it, um, and it's nothing more than a roof over the bees and it's open and facing to the southeast so that um, in the summertime the sun goes overhead and the, um, the, uh, the beehives end up being in the shade and in the wintertime the sun is much lower so then uh, the, the sun shines on them all day. Um, honey productivity oftentimes goes up by a factor of four and uh, yeah you can weave the honey in there so that they, they, they eat their own honey and things like that but basically, it's all about how do you pamper your bees so that they can be healthier and happier. Uh, going hayless. Um, so this is this is a technique. I've got a podcast about this. And um, the idea is is that uh, you you raise stuff in just the right way, and um, uh, the animals will come by in the middle of winter, including in Montana. And in fact, I, I had a long conversation with Joel Salzman about this, and he believes that it that that he's gotten his his operation down to 40 days. So he feeds hay to his animals for 40 days out of the year, which is a, a huge leap forward because normally it's 120. But uh, he believes in his area that he can't go hayless, but that in Montana and in Idaho you can go hayless. 
and, um, and it, it has to do with how um, our winters are drier. Um, but it's uh, so anyway. There's a podcast about it. It's, it's it's possible that once you once you do this, if you're able to do this, you could eliminate a tractor and a bunch of equipment, not to mention a whole bunch of work and time. Why does it say bam bam? Um, is bees just two or three? Am, are the numbers off? I don't know. Uh, 55, never buy chicken feed again. What to plant? Um, so uh, I've got a blog that I wrote. And we've got at least two threads that it permeates on this. Um, and, um, of course, Sepp Holzer uh, says he never feeds his chickens. Um, that, you know, he grows all the food that the chickens need and the chickens self-harvest all year. And then you talk to his son, Yosef, and Yosef says, oh, yeah. We set aside some stuff and feed the chickens about 12 days a year when it's just like everything's just iced over. So um, there's a variety of things you can do so that you never have to buy chicken feed again. Um, I like what Joel Salatin has to say about restaurants. He says every restaurant should have um, a, a chicken yard out back. Throw all the scraps out there and then you get eggs and meat back. Oh, this is this is um, one of the things. This is the example that I use when I talk about the uh, the Wheaton Eco Scale. So Sepp Holzer says, put lots of poisonous plants out for your animals. And then of course, people that are lower on the scale are going to say that's crazy. Um, and then of course, uh, we come along, we explain it, and it doesn't sound so crazy. Um, animals. Um, choose what to eat based on instinct. We have a little bit of this instinct, but our instinct is not nearly as strong as it is for animals. So if I go to Heather and I hold a piece of festering roadkill in my hand and I hold it out for her to eat, Heather will smell that and her instinct will say, do not put that in your pie hole. On the other hand, if I bake chocolate chip cookies, then Heather's instinct will say, please put that in your pie hole. So this is part of our instinctual package. Now when the animals go out in, into a field, like let's say a cow, there'll be this cow that goes out into the field, then the cow finds all kinds of delicious things to eat and picks and chooses what she wants to eat. And then she'll come by a poisonous plant, and she'll choose to not eat that. And then, a few days later, she's not feeling so well. And suddenly, that plant seems like something to nibble on a little bit. The animal is self-medicating. That poisonous plant, because there's going to be a buffet of 40 different poisonous plants, but only one of them seems like it would taste good to nibble on just a little bit, just now and and based entirely on instinct this animal is now able to self-medicate now of course when we put an animal into a pen and we only feed it hay and then it gets sick then we're taking on the responsibility of trying to find out what kind of sick is it and how do we fix that as opposed to having that animal into a paddock that has um, um, a variety of like 50 different kinds of things to eat as normal food and 40 different kinds of poisonous plants, a buffet to, to choose from. No more transplanting. Every time you transplant, you lose the taproot. Every time. And, and now I have presented this, I don't know, 25 times, 30 times. And um, uh, it was about six months ago, I was presenting it to a group of soil scientists and I challenged them. And two of the soil st uh, scientists stood up to say that they believe that that was bullshit. And I said, um, um, nope, I'm sticking to it. And I said, you know, give me your reason. So they both happened to, both of these soil scientists happened to own nurseries. And so then they said that, um, that when they go and they transplant, these plants still have taproots. They dug them up and they can see them. And I said, now wait a minute. Tap roots, plural. So are you saying that when you exposed these plants' roots, you found a tap root, or did you find more like three or four things that looked like tap roots? 
And they said, well, it was the three or four. Aha! You lost the taproot. And then the plant tried to make new taproots out of existing roots, but they don't go nearly as deep as the taproot. So I stand behind this. Um, Sepp Holter avoids all transplanting. And, and if you think about it, and this is also when I give some presentations, I ask the room. Maybe I'll ask this and see how it goes. Who here has um, allowed a volunteer tomato plant to produce and their volunteers outperformed the transplants? So there you go. There's um, me's and yeps here, here. Oh, yeah. Okay, see? The thing is, you can find some people that can say that they allowed the, the volunteer to go on and it did not outperform the transplant. But then the key is, is like, let's observe permaculture. A big part of permaculture is observation. Let's observe those where the transplant did, or no, when the, when the seeded plant, when the volunteer did outperform the transplant. And let's see why. And then let's also observe the case where it didn't, and let's see why there too. And let's get better at this. Basically, I believe there's massive room for all of us to do better in the area of working with volunteers. And so we've optimized what we can do with transplanting. You know, you've got your, your stuff where you pick off all the bottom leaves, and then you do the trench planting with your tomato plants. And, and tomato plants are the, are the most resilient to this. Um, they're, 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 they tolerate transplanting better than most other garden plants, but still, they, they still go through a period of transplant shock, and they lose their taproot. Tefa, textured earth food all year. So um, the idea is, is that if you have a flat surface, then you have homogeneous temperature on the ground, you have a homogeneous le level of water. But then if you start adding texture to the landscape, then you end up with warm spots and cold spots. And so in those warm spots, you can start growing things through the winter. Um, and, and there's so much more to add to it. In this case, we're, we're looking at an example of how you can um, uh, have a reflecting pool, which doubles the amount of sunlight that, that hits a surface. Um, and on the right side, we're showing using some of the ideas from wolf body stuff in order to be able to hold uh, a much warmer temperature throughout the year. Converting a dry gully to a creek is something that is a, a, a tool in the permaculture toolbox. Um, and uh, um, it's, it's something where a lot of creeks are going underground and, and we're losing them because of poor forestry practices. Uh, and um, it's this is it's kind of like a lot of the same tools in the tool set um, for uh, reversing desertification. Um, but then uh, um, the man who planted trees is is a um, a video uh, a 30 minute video that's really beautiful and uh, it, it it tells the story of bringing back creeks by planting a lot of trees and that's a technique in the permaculture toolbox. Um, there's uh, I mean, there's there's a list of techniques, but basically, in a nutshell, it's all about improving the sponge, the organic matter in your watershed. And if you can improve the sponge, then you're you're going to see creeks return. Um, and and sometimes part of it is is that the creek has gone underground, and you can bring it above ground again. <laughs> Stealth pond, dun dun dun. So this is kind of a thing. So there's some places where it's totally illegal to build a pond. And, um, and so what you can do is you can dig your pond, fill it back up with big rocks, and then on top of the big rocks, put on smaller rocks, and on the smaller rocks, put gravel, and then dirt, and then you know your topsoil. So, um, and, and then you basically have this water source that is a pond. It doesn't look like a pond at all. Um, and uh, so there's nothing for anybody to ever complain about. So if you build a pond and you're doing great, and then the Department of Making You Sad shows up and says, you have to get rid of this pond. We command you to do it. Well, maybe this would be a, a possible option. But 
this is something where also your water ends up being cleaner and clearer um, a lot of the times um, because you don't have any of that stuff interacting with it at the surface. And this is a technique that's used in Africa a lot of times in order to be able to have clean drinking water. Husk. Okay, so this is a segue. Um, <laughs> Mr. Rogers' land of make-believe. Mr. Rogers said it was okay for me to make things up. So I made this up. So I've got this story. And I have to say fiction and story and made this up. I have to say it like a dozen times because otherwise people start trying to like add reality into my, my fictitious story and it gets confusing. Um, the idea is that 403 years ago, um, the story about Pocahontas ended in a different way than what, what is real. Um, so uh, John Smith goes home with a bunch of arrows in his butt and Pocahontas goes up and down the coast and says, when those white guys show up from Europe in their big boats and stuff, you need to put arrows in them before they hit the land, okay? And so um, the idea is, is that in my fiction, I say there's uh, such a place as the United States of Pocahontas, which takes place, which is as a boundary that's exactly identical to what we know of as the United States of America, only everything here has evolved differently. So... Um, agriculture that was practiced 403 years ago is um, kind of similar to permaculture, or more accurately, permaculture is kind of similar to that. And so it's kind of like, okay, you start 403 years ago. The population back then was about 200 million um, uh, 403 years ago. So now let's imagine that this population evolves to now over 403 years ago and along the way they say that plow thing we're not into it that's kind of disrespectful to mother earth and those pesticides and stuff yeah that's we don't like that either so now i'm kind of curious what would horticulture today be like if husk were real so i i kind of put together some ideas and and, and i also want to say that in part of my fantasy is that today people would come to the USP as a bit of a health mecca, that they would show up to the USP. People would come from Europe, come to the USP, and their illness would mysteriously go away. I mean, I think that the, the root of cancer is carcinogens. And, and so it just seems bizarre to me to watch these videos of children with cancer and they're sitting in a pool of carcinogens. And and it's like, oh, by the way, Timmy, here's your food. You have to eat non-organic eggs that have been dried, reconstituted, and then fried with toxic geck, and that's your food. Carcinogen central. And uh, so, man, it's a mystery. I mean, it's kind of like part of that thing is, is like illness, disease, and cancer, it comes from the disease fairy. This, this little fairy flies over and makes everybody sick. And it's like, oh, you got cancer? That's bad luck. I guess the cancer fairy visited you and gave you cancer. That's why you got cancer. Well, all right, so I'm wandering off the topic a little bit. But with the United States of Pocahontas, I have this idea that you come here and they don't have the toxins. They don't believe in them. And, and um, uh, so the food, the air, the water, everything is clean and doesn't have all this toxic gick. And suddenly this person who had all this cancer shows up, and their cancer just goes away. All right. Back to reality. How to rediscover what may have been. And so I have this idea, and that is that um, there would be like 2,000 acres, and there would be 20 different artisans in seed and soil. And these artisans would be like maybe in the permaculture, maybe biodynamic, and then uh, we would give each one of them a piece of uh, canvas to work on, a piece of this 2,000 acres, some larger, some smaller, and then um, of course each artisan would look at the other 19 artisans and say, that guy's an idiot. But once a year, all the artisans are put on a bus and taken around to see all 20 of the different canvases. 
And as much as an artisan is going to look at the other artisans and say they're stupid, they might choose to change the way that they do their own art. They might see something at plot number 12. It's like, yeah, that one thing that they did was pretty interesting, but he's doing it all wrong. I'm going to do it better. And another thing at plot number five, it's like, I'm going to, I'm going to bring in some of that, and uh, I'm going to experiment with it a little bit. So each artisan gets to express what they believe is the best, and then hopefully they will all move forward rapidly. On my land, we're going to try and do some of that on a small scale. I've, o I've only got 225 acres, so um, we can't go as big as the 2,000 acre idea, but we'll be able to do some things there. Nettles. Um, I want to see from who all's eating nettles. Type in nettles. Let's see the nettles. Oh, jeez, look at that. Wild harvesting, eating nettles, videos harvesting. Nettles, nettle leaf tea, nettles. So, um, nettles is like one of the superfoods. It, um, and not only that, but if you just steam it for like 30 seconds and eat that, it's a food that has a whole, a, a texture that I've never experienced with any other food before. It's fuzzy food. Um, if you feel like, boy, I need a hamburger. I got to have it. Like eating chicken just isn't going to cut it. I got to have a hamburger or I got to have a cheeseburger. That uh, if you eat nettles, it, it, then that craving goes away. It's, it's wild. Um, I am not a fan of greens, but I got to tell you, I do enjoy eating nettles. I'm not sure how to explain that. And of course, you de-sting them before you eat them, although I have video on YouTube now of people eating nettles raw. So um, I, I think for all the wild crafting food, uh, nettles is my favorite, and I look forward to getting nettles actually to grow in um, and cultivated areas too. I understand there's a lot of different varieties of, uh, of nettles. Some are, some are tasty and there's sunchokes. This is oftentimes referred to as the, the number one survival food. You get more calories per acre with sunchokes than any other food. Um, some people call them fartichokes uh, because they don't digest um, the stuff in them very well, the inulin very well. But I hear that if you cook them properly, that, that uh, it's not a problem. Uh, you can eat them raw. Um, and uh, I've got video of a guy that kept a, a, a pot of sunchokes cooking like all winter long. That's another thing too, is you can harvest them any time of the year. They'll just sit out in the ground until you're ready to harvest them. Sunchokes are like, and, and they're a great pig food, a great chicken food. Um, this is definitely one of the, the, uh, the permaculture bigs. Uh, both chickens and pigs will self-harvest sunchokes. Who's seen my video about mullen? And tell me who who your favorite person in the video was. <laughs> so um, uh, Jocelyn has great pride that uh, her son, yeah, the kid. There you go. Yeah, she has great pride that it was her son that was in there. He really doesn't talk. <laughs> I mean, he'll talk once in a long, long while. But uh, I thought that was great making him the spokesmodel for that video. Um, this is this this plant is great. When people talk about um, uh, native plants and how they want to go kill all the native uh, non-native plants because they're such a powerful native advocate, I think that this this plant is the great example. Uh, the native population um, loved this plant. They called it white man's footprints, uh, and they found I believe 17 different uses for this plant. Um, of course, the top of the list is cowboy toilet paper, but um, uh, there's, there's a lot of medicinal value to it. There's also, uh, I mean, it makes a decent torch. It uh, also um, uh, has the ability to stun fish. Uh, and um, a lot of people believe that it brings good luck just keeping it in your garden. But I've got a whole video on it. I, I think that this is a truly amazing plant. Definitely should always have a few of these in your garden. Um, if, if nothing else, it's just a majest majestic, beautiful plant. Uh, dandelions. Oh, uh, I've got a video of Skeeter. Um, he uh, um, is talking about, you know, the different plants in his garden. He points out dandelion, and he says, "Oh, last year I pulled up my dandelions and I sold them for nine hundred dollars." <laughs> so, um, and of course, I've got a whole new video out. That's fifteen minutes talking about all the benefits of dandelions. 
um, this this it's a it is then it seems like I was at a hotel I was traveling and I was at a hotel and so I turned on the television I saw a commercial where they are spraying uh, dandelions with Roundup and I just thought oh things are so so backward I mean why not why not spray if you're gonna have an example plant to spray why not spray you know something that's toxic that's like actually poisonous like um, it could actually hurt people or something like that or or spray something that you know has very little value but dandelions um, uh, have such huge value they're 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 such an, uh, a great plant for so many different purposes black locust so this is the, the picture on the left is um, a, a new paddock was set up for these sheep to go into and the first thing they ate was the black locust and um, uh, this is I've got a big video about black locust it um, uh, it is like this it's a mega permaculture plant it's got so many so much value to it it fixes nitrogen uh, great bee fodder uh, best wood for outdoor use in northern climates um, or in cold climates I should say um, and uh, it's, it's an excellent feed um, and although it's listed as being toxic and you know when people mention that it's like oh it's, it's toxic you shouldn't let animals eat it it's kind of like you know what on your same list of stuff that's toxic to animals is alfalfa and you know most people go out and spend hundreds of dollars every year to go get alfalfa to feed to their animals it's toxic yes is true don't feed them only alfalfa because they'll bloat and die same thing goes for black locust feed them a balanced diet of uh, diversity lots of different things comfrey um, uh, what the according to Toby Hemingway the queen of permaculture plants um, uh, of lots and lots of values medicinally um, uh, there's a lot of concern over the dangerous alkaloids but apparently the amount of dangerous alkaloids in a cup of comfrey tea is um, one one hundredth that of a bottle of beer and I don't hear people going on about the dangerous alkaloids in beer um, I've got a huge video about this one too um, it's it's a it's a super plant especially under fruit trees greening deserts so um, this, uh, th I think this is Jeff Lawton's project in Jordan, um, and you can kind of see all the greenery that's coming into place um, as the as the years pass. Um, you know, I've um, we've got tons and tons and tons of information. We got a whole forum dedicated to greening deserts out at Permies. Um, oh, somebody did their PDC there, <laughs> Susan. Um, uh, so I, I think this is one of the biggest power tools in the uh, the permaculture toolbox is the ability to green deserts. And I do firmly believe that when we talk about our climate change and how it's being related to greenhouse ga gases, I think uh, that it's dominantly caused by desertification. And so greening deserts and reversing desertification, those are the number one tools in our toolbox to be able to try and correct these these massive massive problems um, but uh, I can I, I do I have a presentation called uh, replacing irrigation permaculture Diego actually recorded me presenting down in the San Diego area a long time ago and that entire presentation is available on YouTube um, now let's see how long Heather takes to get that to find that and post it up here <laughs> This is like this is like just comedy to watch how quick she can find this stuff and do this. She must have like this super internet connection. Um, Art Ludwig has an article: Can a four thousand square foot home be green? And in the article, he says no. And and I I have a podcast with him where I basically contest this and um, uh, and and it it does I I say that it can be green if you've got 20 people living in there and art comes back and there it is Heather got it <laughs> art comes back to say for for a 4,000 square foot home 20 people is not enough I said if you've got 20 people living in the house then it can be green he says he says nope nope 20 is not enough um, which I, I think is really interesting but um, the amount of square footage that people need has been going up and up and up 
And it's like, uh, this kind of leads back to the tiny houses thing. And of course, part of this is, is that if you've got uh, um, a 4,000 square foot home and then you've got one person living in a 4,000 square foot home, how much energy does it take to warm that place in the winter or for a person to be warm in there in the winter time? How much extra cleaning does it require? How many more materials went into it and things of that nature? So um, I think it's, it's an important thing to keep in mind. And I, I, I'm a powerful advocate of, um, I want people to live more luxuriantly than they do now. And at the same time, I think when you start talking about community living, um, then it might be possible to explore that space. Legionella, um, I went to a presentation in, in 2009 and it was about these interesting solar tubes and it was like five minutes until the presentation started and the guy said, hey, before we start, does anybody have any questions? And I said, um, uh, how, how do these things deal with Legionella? And he said, what's that? And I kind of thought, oh no. So before long, I was asked to leave. I tried to explain what Legionella was and they asked me to leave. <laughs> so um, uh, I think it's uh, England right now is actually um, taking out like 90% of their uh, solar hot water installations because people have been getting sick. And, and so a lot of solar hot water installations are like, um, uh, they're not designed to, to consider Legionella. And so um, uh, pneumonia, I think, I, I think it's 85% of all pneumonia is rooted in the uh, Legionella bacteria. Um, and so turn your water heater up. It should be at 140 degrees or hotter. Um, <clears throat> when people say turn it down to 110, don't do that. You're not, the amount of energy you're saving is pennies. But then when you go to the hospital because you've got pneumonia, that's going to cost you a lot more than whatever you save. So be wary of Legionella. When you design your solar hot water systems, be aware of Legionella and, and design with them. Tankless systems don't have a problem with Legionella um, because um, uh, you need to, I mean, basically, um, when you've got your hot water tank set at like 110, it's, it's pretty much a Legionella incubator. It's like, yeah, let's, let's make lots of Legionella. Um, it can become toxic in about a week. So it's like, if you go on vacation for a week and you come back and you take a shower, good chance of getting pneumonia. Oh, Toby Hemingway's thing. This is, um, this is rather brilliant, I think. It, and and I, I want to point out that most organizations about natives are supported. I want to say most. So some people are going to jump up and say, I'm part of a native organization. We're not that way. I'm going to make it clear. Most. I'm going to go so far as to say vast majority. 90 to 95%. Maybe even more than 95% of uh, native organizations are funded, at least in part, by chemical companies. Um, specifically herbicide companies. So um, <laughs> I take the view that all plants should be native to the planet. I think that's a pretty good policy there. Um, uh, sorry, that was just me reading one of the notes that came by from Chad. Uh, so it's, it's amazing because when you're going de to develop a plant bigotry and you're going to say, these plants are my friends and I hate all those plants so much that I want them all to die, then... Um, it kind of gets into the space of like, well, how are you going to get them to die? And um, it, it turns out that, you know, oh, look at this. The, this chemical company that is supporting us is now giving us a great deal on herbicides. So I've got a podcast with um, Forrest Schomer, and he created um, a native organization, and they worked very hard, and they were very passionate about not using any herbicides. And then he you know, the organization was going good, so then he went and worked on other things. And next thing you know, once he left, um, in come the herbicides. And um, not only are they coming in, but now they're starting to make it, like, legally required to use herbicides to fight these non-native plants. So, um, all right, so that's a, you know what, I can, I can be pissed off on that for an hour. But 
let's come back to this point here. Toby Hemingway says that um, you know a lot of people are like growing this yard and they're poo-pooing the permaculture people and saying we should plant only native plants in our yards. And um, so the first question is is like how much of that do you eat? Like none. It's pretty universally zero. I mean, I imagine there are some native plants that provide a certain amount of edibles. And nettles would be a great example, although most people don't plant nettles in their yards. But there, there, you know, there are some edible plants that are fairly good producers that could plant in their yards. Um, but usually, when they plant strictly natives, it's typically more ornamentals and um, uh, not not the edibles. So. Um, if they do that instead of permaculture, that means that uh, two or three acres of uh, uh, native habitat have to be destroyed by farmers in order to feed your sorry ass. So it's kind of like I, I, this whole thing where these people are so passionate about the natives, um, and it's like they don't even. I, I could, you know what? I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be more open to listening to people advocating native only. If their diet consists of at least 90% native plants and they don't use any herbicides whatsoever. But universally, I've found that that's not the case. Um, I've, I've yet to meet a person that falls into that space. So um, I'm not a big, so I, I'm, I'm very reluctant to visit much with the, the native plant folks anymore. Um, here is here's an enormous thing. This is this is I think if if we can conquer this, then this this will change the world in more positive ways than everything else I've ever done, or that I would imagine any other one person has done. If we could get 20 people to live under one roof without anybody getting stabbed, then I I think this is huge. I mean, it, basically we you know I think most people are familiar with going to college and. And you know you got four different people sharing a house or whatever, and and somebody's not doing their dishes, and and it, it's it's a nightmare. Um, but at the same time, we do have like old folks homes where you've got like a hundred people living under one roof, and um, and there are problems, but they're actually getting along pretty damn good, and they're using far less real estate per person, so. We're kind of coming back to that thing about, you know, can a 4,000 square foot home be green? Yes, if there's 20 people living in it. And it's kind of like, so here's the 20 people, and so can we come up with systems? And granted, for all the rest of permaculture, it's like um, a pebble compared to the size of this problem. And um, and I think I think it bears thought. And I've got a bunch of podcasts going into a bunch of details about that. And up here at my place, we're going to try a variety of different experiments. Now for the last slide. Sepp Holzer's Ag Designs can feed 21 billion people without fertilizer or irrigation. So yeah, the mighty, the glorious, the amazing Sepp Holzer. Uh, so I, I don't know that whole, so I, I think we've talked today about energy problems. I think we got that. We got a big solution there. Uh, and since most wars are based on energy problems, then um, I think we've solved uh, a lot of the war problems here. And then um, that whole uh, food thing where people are starving, I think we got a solution for that one too. Um, so I think I think we're making some some awesome progress in the world of permaculture. In 1950, there was one pediatric oncology unit. Today, there are over 200. We bathe daily in an ocean of toxins and carcinogens which we have not yet scientifically proven are toxins and carcinogens. The eggs served in the pediatric oncology unit are dehydrated eggs from chickens fed pesticide-laced foods raised in a horrible environment. Rather than being angry at bad guys, I want to share a thousand bricks for building a better world. The end. That's it. I'm done. Diego, are you there? <laughs>